Hi everyone, uh, thanks for sticking around. Um, it's nice to have you all here. So, um, Lochan and I, uh, my name's Sean by the way, Lochan and I are gonna have a, a talk about um, fluid velocity limits. It's a study that we've done with our, um, between NVIDIA and our partner lab at University of Texas Arlington. Um, we've got a, quite a few contributors, but um, it's been a, a big group effort between NVIDIA and the University of Texas Arlington, so I wanted to thank all the contributors. Um, so just to give a brief background on um, erosion and our interest in erosion. So as some of you uh, probably know that there is a current ASHRAE guidance on uh, 1.5 meters per second fluid velocity. Um, the hope is that if we can go to a slightly higher fluid velocity, we can improve cooling performance. But the risk associated would be risks associated with that would be things like erosion. Um, at a basic level, erosion is caused by the fluid movement of uh, across any surfaces, um, and this is obviously a concern in areas like the coal plate, um, but also on the secondary piping. Um, so Lochon is going to go through some of the um, this, the details on the study and then also some of the results. Hello everyone. Uh, so the experimental setup consists of a copper coal plate which is uh, mounted onto a heater base and it mimics a data center scenario where a coal plate is mounted onto a CPU by GPU and the heat is being carried away by the coolant which is going into the microfilm channels. Uh, there is a heat exchanger present inside the co in, in the coal loop which is used to maintain the coolant at desired temperature and reservoir to have ample amount of samples so that we can collect samples at every, every regular intervals to analyze the coolant. Uh, there are two pumps uh, in this uh, used in this config uh, for this cold, uh, closed loop so to help us uh, circulate high flow rate of coolant uh, through the coal plate. Mm, we installed a few pressure sensors and temperature sensors before and after the cold plate, which will help us to determine the uh, thermal performance and the hydraulic performance of the cold plate throughout the testing period. Uh, there is also a, therm a thermocouple present onto the heater base, which gives us the case temperatures to help us with the thermal resistance. Uh, initially, at the sh uh, day zero, we collect a sample from the uh, reservoir, to which will give us the baseline parameters of the coolant, such as pH conductivity, turbidity, and the copper content present in them. Uh, the main observation for us is to see if there's any erosion inside the copper coal plate, and that would be, from the coolant side, we would be seeing it through increase in the copper content. So to uh, avoid copper presenting any of the other components, we made sure that the uh, closed loop is made from all stainless steel components, like the heat exchanger, the pump casing, the fittings used for the thermocouple and the pressure sensors and uh, and there is a wire uh, only the copper content or uh, the copper present in the loop was from the coal plate so if there is any uh, copper that is being uh, seen in the coolant that would be only from the the coal plate will be the only source for the copper the uh, the pressure sensors and temperature sensors they were all calibrated using standard calibration techniques and the slope and offset values they were all given into the data acquisition systems so that we can minimize the amount of error and the values will be as accurate as possible so so on, upon the findings from the experiment uh, we ran the experiment for a total of one 150 days uh, on day zero, what we observed was the thermal resistance of the coal plate on an average was around 0 0.0238 uh, degrees C by watt. And uh, at the end of testing, we saw the thermal resistance was around 0 0.02386 degrees C by watt. The thermal resistance was constantly uh, like stable throughout the 150 days of testing. There were fluctuations observed, uh, which was around less than 0 0.01 degrees C. Uh, we can say that at high flow rates, even for uh, 150 days of testing, we, uh, the thermal resistance did not change and it was quite stable. Uh, you can see there are two pump configurations mentioned here. Uh, so in the first 48 days, uh, the two parallel pumps which were used, one of the pump wa uh, was failed. So we replaced uh, the failed one with a new one. Uh, so after the 48th day, uh, 40, after the 49th day, the second pump, uh, it, we were able to achieve like around uh, 7.6 uh, LPM. Earlier it was 7. Point, uh, on an average 7.8 to 7.9. After the change of pumps, the uh, flow rate was around 7.6 to 7.7, .7, like around 0.2 LPM drop in uh, flow rate. Uh, but uh, on the thermal resistance side, there was no such change on thermal, uh, noticeable change on thermal resistance of the coal plate. Uh, 
Uh, for on the hydraulic analysis, the pressure drop across the cold plate was also quite stable throughout the testing. There was uh, only uh, fluctuations of around 0.5 to 0.1 uh, kPa throughout the testing period. Uh, for the initial pump one configuration, where uh, we saw the uh, initial uh, at the day zero, the pressure drop across the cold plate was around 224 kPa on average, and uh, after the pump fail uh, uh, fail occur after 48 days of testing. When we swapped the pump with a new one, uh, the pressure dropped, uh, decreased down a little uh, to 214 kPa, but the overall decrease from day 48 to day 150 was 0 0.02 kPa, which was, uh, which was almost negligible if we consider the errors from the measurement. Uh, next, next would be the uh, coolant analysis. Uh, coolant uh, samples were collected for every 30-day interval from the test setup. At the days, uh, we made some comparisons for the uh, different parameters uh, at day zero and the final day of analysis. For the copper content, which uh, the main source of copper would be a coal plate, we saw that uh, at day zero, the baseline sample, the copper content was around 0 0.141 ppm, which is almost 141 parts per billion inside the, co uh, inside the coolant. At the end of testing, there was a quite uh, a small uh, increase in the copper content, which is 0 0.248 parts per million, which uh, corresponds to 248 parts per billion. Uh, uh, this is a very small increase in the copper content, and uh, this is uh, within the recommended standards of the vendors, usually, which is around if the copper content increases more than 3 ppm or 3.5 ppm, then we have to take some critical measures to uh, Replace the uh, to observe the coolant uh, chem uh, chemical analysis, and the next one was the corrosion inhibitors. Uh, at the baseline sample, if we consider the corrosion inhibitors were at 100 percent, 100 percent. At the final day of analysis, we saw the, co uh, the corrosion inhibitors drop to 98.58 percent, which is almost a 1.44 percentage drop, and this is due to usually. Uh, some corrosion inhibitors are utili usually utilized for passivation, and uh, that could be one reason for the decrease in uh, corrosion inhibitors. Next parameter is the pH of the liquid. Uh, at the start of testing, at day zero, the pH was observed to be on an average of 8.5. At the end of testing, at 158 day, the pH was seen to be around 8.2. Uh, There's also a small decrease in uh, pH value, uh, but it is under the acceptable limits. Usually, the critical limit for any pH, uh, the pH of any coolant uh, from the vendors is uh, in between 6.5 to 7.5. So, for us, for the over, over 150 days of testing, uh, it is still inside the safe level. Uh, the conductivity was also seen to be decreased from the day zero. Uh, at initially, it was around 4,600, and after the uh, on the last day, uh, on the 150 day sample. We saw around uh, uh, 4,500, uh, almost 4,600. Just uh, the decrease in the conductivity can be explained by the decrease of corrosion inhibitors. Usually, the, co uh, the level of corrosion inhibitors is directly related to the conductivity of the liquid. As we saw, a decrease of 1.4% in corrosion inhibitors it is directly correlated to the uh, decrease in the conductivity level of the coolant as well. Uh, for the, on the turbidity analysis, uh, on day zero, we saw that. Uh, the baseline sample had uh, one NTU of turbidity on an average. Uh, at the 158 day, when the sample was analyzed, uh, the turbidity value increased to 34 NTU. Uh, we are further investigating the correlation of turbidity and how it would affect the cool, uh, coolant's uh, performance and how it would uh, correlate with the erosion mechanism. Uh, we are still uh, un uh, in experimental phase of that. And after the coolant analysis, we performed a few surface topography analysis for the EPDM hose and also on the uh, two different sections of the uh, copper coal plate. On the EPDM hosing, which we were used, uh, it was a three by eight inch hose. The velocities uh, for 7.7 .7 LPM for three by eight inch ID hose, it's around uh, 1.74 meters per second. And using an optical microscope, when we uh, were observing the internal surfaces of the uh, uh, EPDM hose, we saw there was no, there was a minimal changes in, there were no, no noticeable changes onto the surface topography. Upon further analysis using an SEM machine, we saw that uh, there were a few shiny spots onto the e uh, used EPDM uh, surface, uh, where you can see on the bottom image uh, the gray. Uh, uh, so these shiny spots, we perform EDS to see what is the composition of the uh, these spots. We saw most of the uh, uh, it was like a ca carbon and oxygen present in that. There was no traces of co copper to be seen on any of these uh, shiny spots. 
uh, on the uh, uh, surface topography of the copper uh, coal plate, there were two spots which were mainly focusing for us. Uh, one was the area where uh, the microfin channels were uh, present and the first impact point. On the microfin channels, when we uh, performed optical microscopy, we used an optical microscope to see the surface topography. Uh, there were some topography changes in on the uh, fins, and when we used an SEM machine to observe that, we see some dark spots to present onto the top of the fin surfaces. Uh, we are still investigating the uh, reason for this uh, dark spot formations, if it's due to the uh, reaction of the coolant with the copper at elevated temperatures and a high, uh, high fluid velocities, or is it due to any other mechanism like corrosion, erosion, or uh, we are just uh, 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 investigating that uh, scenario. Uh, the next point of uh, observation for us was the first impact point. Uh, usually th this is the point where the coolant enters the coal plate uh, from the EPDM hose. Uh, and uh, the velocity of the uh, uh, coolant at this particular section was around 2.62 meters per second. And uh, from optical microscopy, uh, we couldn't see any noticeable changes in the surface topography. And upon further analysis with an SEM, we saw that there were some dark spots present onto the surface. Uh, we are still investigating uh, the reason for the formation of these dark spots, if these are due to the uh, any failure mechanism, or is it just the uh, interaction between the liquid and uh, copper surface at high temperature and uh, high flow rates. Thanks, Lotron. Um, so in conclusion, we do plan to run some future studies. Uh, we're going to actually have a side-by-side -side with a control experiment at the ASHRAE limit of 1.5 meters per second, just to get a sense of what we're seeing is due to higher fluid velocity or what you would normally see at the, the, uh, the typical fluid velocity is around 1.5 meters per second. Um, overall, the PG25 fluid health um, seems relatively healthy based on the standard metrics like pH, um, conductivity, etc. We did notice that unusual uptake in turbidity, which we're trying to understand better um, and um, be happy to talk to the audience about that further. Um, but we did get to 2.62 meters per second with relatively um, no major red flags in the fluid health. In terms of the EPDM hose material, we again, based on the analysis we did, um, uh, we didn't see any clear failure mechanisms apparent. Um, we are also talking to various EPDM hose manufacturers and we're operating well within any guidelines that they give for uh, fluid velocity as well. In terms of the SEM analysis, the copper coal plate, we do want to do some more investigations about the dark spots. It's not clear whether it's just uh, some sort of you know, residue that's left over or an artifact of the SEM itself. So a side-by-side -side with a control experiment will help um, us understand that a little bit better. Thanks. Um, so in terms of next steps, as I mentioned, we do want to focus in on this control leg at 1.5 fluid, uh, 1.5 meters per second. Um, we do want to do some additional analysis of uh, the copper surfaces um, with the higher fluid velocities. We're also working uh, with ASHRAE on the RTA, um, with Mark Stenke and some others to try and address this and see if we can get the, the limits updated if needed um, as soon as possible because there's a lot of um, feedback we're getting from various folks on the, the justification be behind this 1.5 meters per second fluid loss limit. Um, as a call to action, um, please do join in the coal plate sub-project and cooling environment calls. These are the links. Um, and thank you all for sticking around. Uh, let's know if there's any questions. Lo Chang, uh, yes. you saw some increase in copper in the coolant, right? Yes. Have you run the particle analysis before and after to see if it's changed? Because you, sh you see the turbidity change too. I wonder if there's a big change of particle size in the coolant. You, th you mean like a DLS type, just to see the particle size? Yeah, like yeah. a yeah. micron size. Let's say you have a lot of particle between five to 10 after the exposure and there's no significant difference. Is it the stripping curve? You can actually find the difference, see if there's increase of larger particle causing that small erosion on the microfin surface. Yeah, yeah, so I think what, what Phil's getting at is that um, we could do like a dynamic light like scattering on DLS analysis and see if we can look at the profile of the particles. 
So that's something that we should probably consider. But the other point is it could be related to other things in the loop as well, not necessarily just the copper. So yeah. what that's why the control leg is kind of important so we can compare and contrast if it's as related to the higher fluid velocity or not. Yeah, does yeah, the loop have the inline filter? Uh, yes, it had a 15 micron inline filter. A 15 micron, yeah. okay. So, so yeah, it, it could definitely be smaller. Yeah. So it'd be good to find out if there's a change, mm -hmm. the yeah. small particle that passed through the filter. Yeah, thanks, John. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, thanks, everyone. Oh. Is that one?